So here we go. Luke 5. On one day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He, that's Jesus, saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Let's pray. Father, in these next few moments, I ask that you would speak to us. Speak to us and help us to obey you, to trust in you, to live for you. In Christ's name, amen. Now, what might this story have to say to this massive question of what makes the Christian God so unique? What makes the Christian God unique? Well, let me start with this, almost a preface to what I'm about to say. Fundamental to Christian belief is the understanding that God has made himself known in Jesus, okay? We have this language all throughout, particularly the New Testament, but we have it in John's gospel, this, this massive picture of the word made flesh. John in his gospel tells us that, but Paul uses the language of the image of the invisible God, and he's using those words to describe Jesus. So if we want to understand something of the Christian God, if we get to Jesus, that's going to help us out. If we understand who Jesus is, that gets us to understanding more the richness of who the Christian God is. Israel's God has been revealed to us, and it's in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, the story of Luke 5 is very rich. There's so many layers to it. But basic to understanding any kind of story, uh, irrespective of genre, is understanding the context. Generally speaking, if you get the context wrong, you get the meaning of that story wrong. So we need to understand the context of the story. So let's go sort of to ground zero, like really basic understanding of the story. First is that the story takes place um, on a beach. Which is interesting because Jesus is a rabbi. He was viewed also as a rabbi in that, in that moment in first century Palestine. And he's not teaching in a religious setting. He's not teaching in a, a synagogue or a temple. He's teaching on a beach. Uh, but more than that, he's teaching on a smelly beach. All the people around him, they're, they're cleaning their nets. They're not emptying their nets because they, their nets are empty. Uh, they had, have not caught anything that previous night. So not only is Jesus on a beach, he's on a smelly beach, but he's also surrounded with a bunch of grumpy fishermen. It's not a great context to be in. Uh, because these guys are grumpy. Why? Because they haven't caught anything. They spent the whole night fishing and came up with nothing. Now, the, the rhythm for these guys would be to go fishing at night, and then in the morning, whatever they got, they would empty their nets, take the fish, and they would take the fish to the market, and that would be their pay for the day. They're probably not too pumped that morning because they've actually spent the entire night and they've come up empty. So here is Jesus, and that's where he is on this beach, smelly beach, around grumpy guys because they haven't caught any fish. 
Now, if you're interested in this, just uh, a footnote here to, uh, I think that's important. A guy by the name of Ken Bailey, he's passed away now, but I've pulled a lot of my study from Ken Bailey. He's written a book called Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes. And even if you're thinking, oh, I don't read that kind of stuff about Bible stuff, I would highly recommend this book because it's like it's a real page turner. And you can't say that about many books commentating sometimes on the Bible. Sometimes they're, they, they, people make it actually harder to understand Jesus. But Ken Bailey does a really good job actually bringing this story to life. But I say that because I've gathered a lot of the information in terms of understanding the cultural context uh, for this story from him. Now, let's go a little further. Jesus says something very strange to Peter. He says, put your, put your nets into the deep water. Now, on the, on the context or on the, on the surface, that's really um, not that big of a deal to us. But the reason why that's interesting is because Jesus is the rabbi, okay, and he's giving advice to Peter, the fisherman, okay? Now, if you're going to just, just imagine the story, Peter is not in a great mood because he hasn't caught anything. And now he's taking advice from who? A rabbi. Now, Peter was a fisherman. This is what he did. This was his business, okay? It wasn't a hobby. It was his profession. It's bread and butter. This is how he made a living for his family. And then Jesus, a rabbi, is giving him fishing advice. So if I'm Peter, I'm thinking something along the lines of, hey, Jesus, look, you're the rabbi. I don't tell you what to do. How about you not tell me what to do? This is, I think, part of why Peter says to him, master, look, we've worked hard all night. But it gets a bit even more interesting because back then, first century, to now on that area, Lake Gennesaret, which is part of the Sea of Galilee, fishermen would not fish during the day. There was a reason these guys were fishing at night because fish are not out during the day. They're hiding under the rocks during the day. And more than that, they're not out in the deep water. They're actually near the shore where all the fresh water is. And even more specifically, it is very interesting. The nets that these guys would have been using are called trammel nets. They're a type of linen net. In other words, they were specifically used for night fishing. So if you can think of Jesus asking Peter to put his nets on the deep, Peter's thinking, hold on, I'm using this net that is only used for night fishing, and I'm also putting this net that the fish can actually see out into the deep water where the fish are not swimming. Are you with me? This is utterly futile what Jesus is telling him. This is why Peter says, Master, look, Jesus, um, I think you're really good at teaching and doing the holy stuff, but trust me, this will be useless. Let me just go home to my wife because this is, this is I've, been, I've, I've had a really bad night. But he doesn't say that. He says, look, we've, we've worked hard all night, but because you're asking us, because you say that, we will put our nets out. And then something happens. The nets start breaking. The boats start sinking because of this lottery-sized catch of fish. Now, let me just pause there for a moment. Again, this is what Peter did. This is how he made his money for his, this is with his livelihood. You have to understand that for Peter, fish meant money, okay? So when Peter sees all this fish coming to his boat, it's dollar signs flashing in his eyes, okay? He, I'm thinking if I just get my imagination going, I'm thinking he's going to be able to go home and say, honey, look, you wanted that trip to the Bahamas? We're doing the Bahamas now. Kids, you want to go to Disneyland? Disney World here in Florida? We can do that because we just came into this massive, colossal size of fish. He's thinking money. That's why actually even in the narrative, it's a very specific word. He signals because for Peter, this is a financial secret. He knows that the, the, the voice travels seven times further over water than land. He's not yelling. He's not shouting. He's not even talking. He's signaling. Get over here because he's, he's going he's gonna to like get in on this and he doesn't want to let the other people. He's like, this is his stuff. Very interesting. But it doesn't stop there. He then says, there's something, the strangest, there's a crescendo to the strangest because he doesn't stop there. He then bows down at Jesus' feet in the boat and says, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Very strange language to be using in a place that was not holy, it was not a religious setting. It was on the water. 
Now, there is so much to tease out from that passage, but what I want to do here in the next few moments, we're going to come back to that passage. I want to just uh, draw for you three characteristics that speak to this question, what makes the Christian God unique? I want to start by saying that from this passage we see, first, the Christian God speaks. The Christian God speaks. Now, I understand that even as I say that, that might be a point that sort of washes over us. But we have to understand that this idea of God speaking is a distinguishing factor. God speaks. And we see this actually both in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, and also the New Testament. It's not as if this point of God speaking in Jesus is just like parachuted in as like atypical. No, this is a story, this is a theme that we see from beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation, the story of a God who speaks to us personally. Uh, David, in the Psalms, he, he's comparing Israel's God to the, the, the idols of the nations. In Psalm 135, verse 15 to 17, he writes these words, the idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. They have eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. What is he saying there? He, he, it, it's as if David is doing a panoramic view of all the, the plurality of beliefs, multiplicity of convictions, ideas, and saying, look, you see these idols that you know, and he's speaking into this ancient Near Eastern context. He's saying, look, you know these idols, some of which are comprised of wood, some are of different metals. They, they might have eyes, they don't see. They might have mouths, they don't speak. They might have ears, they don't hear. He's saying, look, but Israel's God is one who speaks. He sees, he hears. Do you know God's voice in your life? Do you know his voice? Now, just taking a step back for a moment, have you ever had the opportunity to speak to someone who is famous, you know, someone who may be even a celebrity or someone who you just look up to, someone who you, you know, if you were around them, you'd, you, you, you could probably imagine yourself getting a bit nervous and sort of not knowing what to say? Have you had that opportunity before? Well, years ago, when I was a youngster, I, I had this opportunity and it was an opportunity to speak to a guy who I, I actually had idolized. His name is Joe Carter. He was a player for the Toronto Blue Jays. Now, uh, I, I'm Canadian. I grew up in the Toronto area. Uh, and um, that means, actually, if you prick my skin still today, I, I bleed maple syrup. I'm just, I'm just that Canadian. Um, but... Joe Carter was the face of the franchise for the Toronto Blue Jays. That means, you know, if, you, if, if the chips were down, if you needed a guy to come through and get a big hit, that was the guy. You wanted him at home play. In, in 1992, he caught the final out of the World Series. 1993, he helped them clinch a second championship, back-to-back -back against the Philadelphia Phillies by hitting the walk-off home run. He was the guy. And both those years, I had the opportunity to come to Florida to, to see uh, the Blue Jays spring training with uh, my uncle and aunt. They brought us there and, uh, with my cousins. And after, at the end of the day, after these games, we, uh, me and my cousins, we would swap stories of like, whose autograph did you get? Who, like, what player did you get to talk to today? And did you get a photograph? Did, what players did you see? Who did you talk to? Now, if you know anything about spring training for baseball, it's a special thing because you get, to, you get to see the players up close. You get to watch them, you know, practice and you can talk to them and it, it, it's, a, it's a special experience. On one particular day, I was able to talk to Joe Carter. And we came back to our accommodation this one afternoon and uh, we're sitting in this circle, and really this was a moment where we would just brag about who we saw, who we talked to, and uh, I just sort of did one of these, and, I, uh, uh, <clears throat> and, everyone, and you know, my cousin looked up at me, and I said, I talked to Joe Carter today. And my one cousin looks at me and says, you talked to Joe Carter? And I said, yeah, I talked to Joe Carter. And he said, well, what did he say? What did he say to you? I looked at him and I said, he said to me, how are you doing? <laughs> and my cousin looked back at me and said, and what did you say? <laughs> I looked and I said, 
I told him, good. My cousin looked back at me and said, is that it? I just said, yes, that's it. That story, that story of a 30-second conversation with this guy, Joe Carter, who was my hero, was superficial. Hey, how you doing? Good. The end. But it put me over the moon with excitement that I had the opportunity to even have 30 seconds with this guy. But it made no difference, really, when you drill down. But just think that the Christian God speaks. He speaks to you. He speaks to me. And when he speaks, it's profoundly personal. In this moment, it, it, with Peter, it changed his life. It was a watershed moment for him. Peter, it says, we see that Peter left everything and followed him. It changed the rest of Peter's life. Do you know his voice? God speaks. But more than that, the story tells us that God pursues us. God pursues you. This is, this is part of the big story of the Christian faith. The story of a God who not only speaks, but a God who actually is coming after you. He's pursuing you. In this past week, I was in Sri Lanka, and on one day I had an opportunity to just walk the city there. It's a beautiful city. And I walked, uh, walked into uh, a Buddhist temple. And there were these different shrines. And it was interesting because uh, at this particular temple, there were also um, Hindu uh, shrines and places of worship as well. So I had an opportunity to just walk around and see the, the, the place there. And also, I was in a room uh, where uh, uh, Buddhist monks were uh, praying. And it struck me that even when you think of prayer, okay, in the Christian faith, even in prayer, it's actually not our initiative. Prayer is a response to God coming after us. But just hold that for a moment. Because if you contrast that with all the other faiths, major religions, prayer in other faiths, even if you look at something like Buddhism, is not actually a response. It's actually our initiative. In, in a way, it's almost a way of getting to fill in the blank. In some religions, it might be God. In others, it might be salvation. In others, it might be a place of peace, nirvana, whatever you call it. But it's, it's our initiative. But in Christianity, it's the other way around. It's a completely different category. In Christianity, God is actually coming after you. So even even when we set out our initiative, it's not really our initiative. It's a response to him because he's already come after us. It's a completely different category. This is why if you think about it, uh, have you ever been asked the question, uh, do all, don't all religions lead to God? Don't all paths lead to God? Any, any of you, I'm looking at you, none of you are responding. Is there any kind of like Okay, because I'm thinking, there's no way all of you are living in a cave like during the week. There's no possibility. But anyway, look, that's a common question. Even if you're not even into those conversations, at some point you'll hear it through friend or you might ask it yourself. But here's why that, there's a disconnect in that question to Christianity because that question assumes that there's some way in which we get to God. Are you with me? But Christianity redefines that whole conversation. Because Christianity says, nothing can actually get you to God. Religion cannot get you to God. You cannot get yourself to God. Only God can get us to God. That is why it's so profoundly important to see that in Christianity, God comes to us. Because he knows we can't actually get there. And he pulls us out. And that's how we get to God. Not of our own intellectual capability, our financial affluence, whatever it is, nothing can get us there. Only God. That is why it is so beautiful to understand that Jesus, Israel's God, revealed to us in the flesh, comes to us. Amazing. Think, I hear these words from C.S. Lewis. He puts this in a different way, but still really punctuates his point. He's, again, doing this panoramic view of all the religions and saying, look at the Christian God. He says this, the pantheist God does nothing, demands nothing. He is there if you wish for him, like a book on a shelf. He will not pursue you. The shock comes at the precise moment when the thrill of life is communicated to us along the clue we have been following. It is always shocking to meet life when we thought we were alone. And therefore, this is the very point at which many draw back. 
I would have done so myself, I could, and proceed no further with Christianity. An impersonal God? Well and good. A subjective God of beauty, truth, and goodness inside our own heads, better still. A formless life force surging through us, a vast power which we can tap, best of all. But God himself? Alive? Pulling at the other end of the cord? Perhaps approaching at infinite speed? The hunter? King? Husband? That is quite another matter. There comes a moment when people who have suddenly, who have been dabbling in religion, man's search for God, suddenly draw back. Supposing we really found him. We never meant to come to that. Worse still, supposing he had found us. That is the Christian God. A God who comes after you. And the question is, will we respond? The question is not, who's going to initiate this? No, it's been made very clear. Do you know his pursuit? He pursues you. He's after you. Like the hunter, the king. Christian God, the Christian God speaks, he pursues, and he is personal. In other words, he wants a relationship with you. Isn't it interesting? Now, just think, try to think of some kind of 21st century analogies to Jesus Christ's schedule, okay? He was busy. I, I, I'd like to think that if Jesus were here in the 21st century right now, if he were on social media, he would definitely need to offload that to someone to manage his account. He would definitely need someone to manage his Twitter, his, his Facebook, and his Instagram, because he was busy, okay? Someone, some, hey guys, look, uh, Peter, look, you, you take the phone, you take, you, you take the picture of this meal, okay? I, I just don't have time for that, but you know, that people want to see this meal, you know, you know he, other people want to see the hummus, okay? I can't, I don't have time to take a picture of the hummus and the olives right now. You do that. He was busy. People wanted to talk to him. People wanted to have him in a conversation to perform a miracle, to have a meal with them. He was busy. So isn't it interesting that when Jesus Christ says, Peter, put your net out into the deep, in the deep, he does not say to Peter, and look, I actually, I've got a packed schedule today. It's like chock-a-block. It's really busy today. But look, uh, 2 o'clock, I've got a 15-minute window at 2 o'clock. So look, you come back, let's, let it, let's get a nice cup of coffee, two, 2 o'clock, and we'll debrief on this. You let me know how that goes. He doesn't do that, does he? It's very interesting. Why does he not do that? The reason why Jesus does not do that is because Jesus is not after a business transaction. He is after a relationship. When Peter bows down at Jesus' feet, he's doing so in the boat. Jesus is in the boat with him. So listen closely. When God calls you, he's with you every step of the way. When Jesus asked Peter to do this, something that sounded so audacious, it did not make sense. Jesus was with him the whole way. The Christian God is personal. He speaks. He pursues us. So if this is the case, what does that mean for us today? in this moment that for some of us in this room, we might feel actually very disconnected. Such a different world. On the Lake Gennesaret, uh, Peter was different to me. That doesn't, that, that, uh, I'm not tracking with that. What does that mean really today as we walk out? I want to suggest to you that we actually can take a cue from Peter because Peter left everything and followed Jesus. Very dramatic and for some of us, we might think it, it's a bit hyperbole. He left everything and followed him. Really? Come on now. Did he really leave everything, didn't follow him? What does that mean? Well, let's go back to the beginning of the story because the beginning and the end of this narrative sort of capture th the drama of what happens. Because when Peter first greets Jesus, he uses the word master. Remember that? He's the master. Look, we've worked hard all night. That word in the Greek is ambiguous. It could be master, teacher, boss. But in the very end, after encountering Jesus, he uses the word Lord. He says, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. I want to suggest to you that in that moment, when Peter saw Jesus perform this miracle, 
it was not just sort of like another guy pulling a rabbit out of the hat or some miracle, one-off. He saw something of God revealed to him in Jesus. And he bowed down to him and confessed, you are God. He left everything and followed him. So the million-dollar question I want to put to you this morning is, are you following Christ? And maybe we have to even go back first and say, do you know Christ? Because if there's this disconnect in our minds thinking, I don't understand why Peter would do that, the, the first question we have to ask ourselves then is, do we actually know this God? Have we encountered him? Is it more than theoretical knowledge? Because there has to be at some point in our uh, paradigm, our lens through which we view everything, there has to be this transition from seeing God as just a set of ideas to be understood to a person who can be known. Because that is the, the, the truth, goodness, and beauty of the Christian faith, that there's this God who has been made known to us. It's not just theoretical, it's, it's relational. Are you following him? Have you committed your life to him? Let me close with this story. This past week, I was reminded of the story of 21 Coptic Christians. You may remember the story, but 21 Coptic Christians who were viciously murdered by ISIS. It was not too long ago. If you remember the, 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 the photo and the video also went viral, but it's just, you see these guys on the shore and all these Coptic Christians are in these orange jumpsuits, and behind them are members of ISIS shrouded in black, and they have blades next to each guy's neck. And if you remember the story, the story was that they were told, and they filmed this. I never uh, watched the video, just read the story because I... I, I knew enough just by want, uh, reading the story. But the story goes that they were told if they renounce Jesus Christ, their lives will be spared. All they had to do, all they had to do in that moment was renounce Jesus Christ and they'd remove the blade from the neck. The blade was on these guys, their necks. Some shouted out, some mouths the words, Yerab Yasua, Yerab Yasua. Oh Lord Jesus. They were all killed. They would not renounce their faith in Jesus. Instead, they called out his name. They left everything to follow him because he was worth that much. Have you called out to him? Have you called out to him? Yes, sir. Oh, Lord Jesus. Do you know this God, a God who speaks, who pursues you, who's after a personal relationship? Let's pray. Just in this moment as the band comes back, I, I don't often do this, but just with everyone, just uh, all our eyes closed, I just want to ask in this moment, if there's anyone who would say, you know what, I need to commit myself afresh to Jesus. That, that kind of disposition, that conviction that says, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, because you are worth that much. I'm going to follow you. If that is you, I'm just going to ask you in this moment to, to raise your hand. I'd love to pray for you. If that is you, just take a moment. Okay, I see that hand, yeah. I might just say, yeah, I want this. I hear that testimony of those guys saying, 
Yeshua, I want that commitment again in my life, that this is real, it's not just theoretical, I'm gonna give my life for this. He's gonna wait and I'll pray for you. Father, in this moment, thank you that you are here. Your spirit is here with us. Thank you, God, that this is not just some theoretical exercise that we go through, but it's a real, actual relationship into which we are invited. So I pray for those in this room who would say, I, I want to commit my life afresh to you, Jesus. I pray that you would strengthen them, embolden them, give them courage, and I pray you'd fill them now afresh with your spirit. Lord, may we be the ones who are counted as faithful. Give us the grace to follow you with everything we've got. In your name, amen.